Hello, maths fans. I am here in Heidelberg for the annual Heidelberg Laureate Forum. This is the fifth time that I have been to this fantastic city and this fantastic event. Uh, and today I'm very pleased to be joined by the Fields Medal Laureate. Uh, this is Gert Boltings, who is a professor at the Max Planck Institute in Bonn. And you were awarded your Fields Medal in 1986. Is that correct? Yeah, that's very correct. And what do you, what do you remember about that period? Anything at all? Do you remember the, the phone call, the letter you received? How did that experience go? Well, I got a letter in the, uh, in the winter before, mm -hmm. and I was told that I got it, and I was asked not to tell um, anybody else. <laughs> and so I went to Berkeley with my family, which was mm -hmm. my wife and my first daughter. And then, uh, well, it was in Berkeley, in the Greek theater. Mm -hmm. And we sat there and I got it. Fantastic. And I, I feel like this is a difficult question to answer, but given you had made so many fantastic um, discoveries or progress on a whole host of mathematical problems, did you have any idea that you could potentially be receiving such an award or was it just you were just concentrating on solving problems and it happened? No, when I was young, I mean, my, my first goal, goal was to get tenure so I could make <laughs> a living out of mathematics. Yeah. And, I, and I thought Fields Medal was for the famous people. And, uh, well, I was just happy to get a permanent position. Mm -hmm. And then I got a permanent position and I... And also I learned uh, my teacher, Professor Nastold, had a friend's bureau in Paris and he had the ideas about the model conjecture. Mm -hmm. And I thought, uh, well, I won't solve it, but uh, maybe something interesting comes out of it. And I did it and then, well, and then suddenly it happened. Yeah. So it's really interesting you said your, just just then you said you didn't think you would solve it. Yes. So when was there a point as you were studying the problem uh, when you thought to yourself, ah, maybe I can solve this, or did it? No, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I didn't think maybe I can solve it, but I solved it. Yeah. But at least uh, if you do this and you are anxious that you might have made a mistake, of course, and you yeah. first have to check it, and mm -hmm. of course many times you have made a mistake and it doesn't work. But in this case it worked, and so it was suddenly I became from becoming a small guy who just got a permanent job to uh, became one of the stars of the field. Mm. And, and did, did you really notice that? In, in your life then? Did it feel like your, your life changed as a result? Yes, of course. Well, uh, <laughs> people had to laugh about my bad jokes. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I, I got, uh, got good jobs in the US. Yeah. And uh, well, and people talked, I got in the newspaper and so on. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a change of life. Yeah. And you mentioned that um, you were working in the US yes. at the time. Um, and then you have since moved back to Germany. Yes. So was that always a, a plan? Did you sort of, because you, of course, are originally from Germany, studied here, went to the US. Did you always think, I'm going to come back to Germany? Or was it to do with the opportunity you had to come back? Well, uh, to come back was mainly a question about my uh, two daughters. Okay. I learned uh, from others in the US if the... Mm -hmm. If you wait too long, then the children become American and they, <laughs> and they refuse to speak your native language oh, I see. and so on. And so, and we, uh, we had all our relatives here. Mm -hmm. And so I said after nine and a half years, uh, the children were still in elementary school. Yeah. And I thought that's a chance to change. Mm -hmm. So were you teaching them German in, in the house in the US as well? Would you communicate, were you trying at least to? 
No, no, I mean, we, we talked, of course, German in our house. Okay. And yeah. so they learned German. Yes. But then they went to uh, nursery school, kindergarten, and yeah. elementary school in the US, and so they learned also a lot of English. So. Yeah, okay. And, they, and I assume, are they now themselves still based in Germany, or did they go back to the US? No, no, they both live in Germany. Okay, so it worked. Yes. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Um, and then the the position um, that you had, I guess, for the perhaps largest part of your career was with the Max Planck Institute. Yes. Yes, where you, as you said, are still uh, a professor there, though now retired. Yes, I'm now yes. retired. Um, so I suppose, could you just give us um, an insight into how the Max Planck Institute actually works? Because <laughs> I think it's very different to a traditional university. No, it's not a university. Yeah. The Max Planck Society was founded in the early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And the original idea is that there was some, some uh, powerful director uh, who would uh, do everything and he would determine yeah. everything. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, and they have had research institutes uh, all over Germany in various fields. So then this evolved and well, it was called Kaiser Wilhelm Society after the emperor, mm -hmm. because yep. it was done during his time. Mm -hmm. But after World War II, Kaiser Wilhelm was no more, in, uh, well, was no more liked. Mm -hmm. And so they changed it to Max Planck, yep. who was then very old, but he became the first uh, president, and uh, they found this. And, uh, well, it has maybe, I don't know, maybe perhaps in the order of 100 institutes, which are distributed all over Germany. And, uh, well, and if you are in there, you come together there three times a year to discuss matters, mostly new appointments. Mm -hmm. And so you meet also many colleagues in other fields. And the people, so, so you mentioned that, sorry, that, there was the um, the director or the yes. person at the top. So did they set the agenda for that particular institute? Yeah, that was, so. but now these times, usually there are several directors and they alternate as managing directors. So it's also in Bonn. So as a managing director, you have to sign everything and you try to keep things away from your colleague. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so you are this for two years, and then after the two years, you you can in good conscience leave these things to the other guy. Okay. And how then, with you mentioning you are retired? Yes. At the so does that mean you're no longer doing maths, or does that mean no, you're no I'm, longer I'm doing maths? No, I'm still the... doing maths, but good. I don't have to go to administrative meetings. I see. <laughs> so that's all it really means. You have yeah. retired from the administrative part of the job. Yeah, for the mathematicians, it's not so bad. It's harder for the experimental scientists because they uh -huh. need a lab to do something. Yes. And they usually get, I think they get a small lab. Right, okay. But, but for me, it's easy. I mean, nobody forbids me to think <laughs> about mathematics. Yes, no. And um, what are you currently thinking about then? What? Oh, I have some old problem which I can, can't solve for many years. Mm -hmm. But it's still too interesting to let it go. <laughs> Spoken like a true mathematician right there. So, well, so when you say old, is this 20, 30, 40 years? How, how long have you been thinking about this Maybe problem? it's now 10 years. Okay, okay. But, uh, well, it seems to be you solve the problems you can solve, and then you are left with the ones you can't solve. Do you have a favorite number? A favorite number? No. No. Okay. Most people don't. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, okay. So we don't have any favorite numbers. Um, if you have to pick one, is mathematics created or is it discovered? I don't know. I mean, how do you check whether it's created or discovered? Yes. Okay. So I mean, again, it's, it's, uh, it's an old question, but it, it is. can, yeah. Yeah, okay. It's always an interesting one, I feel. Yes, yeah. um, I think my opinion changes daily, to yeah, be honest, depending yeah, on who I'm yeah. speaking to. Um, now, your general uh, subject area, um, arithmetic geometry. Yes. Now, this is quite an advanced 
topic for undergraduate level mathematicians who, at least I think in, in the Oxford course, my students possibly would be introduced to this in third year, yes. a third degree um, or fourth year, depending on the, the options that they pick. So could you give us, in your opinion, a uh, what is arithmetic geometry? For, for any undergraduate students watching who are considering what should they study? It's a mixture of number theory and algebraic geometry. The so number three is if you think about one, two, three, and so on. Mm -hmm. And algebraic geometry, they're sort of, uh, you think about varieties defined by polynomials, algebraic equations. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, you can translate this into into algebra, into rings, and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think, well, uh, and I sort of like it to mix this with number theory because you then also have to think about sizes and so on. Mm, okay, so it sounds quite interdisciplinary then in terms of branching several areas, yeah, it's potentially distinct areas, yes. areas of mathematics. Yeah. Is, is that something that you find appealing? Instead of just focusing on one, you can kind of use ideas from other areas? It's appealing, but I mean, well, uh, anywhere you use ideas from other people, and I mean, in this case, it, I don't think it, it, it gets easier because it's from two fields. Okay, okay. Um, and what would you say, uh, this is kind of, question is inspired by um, Efim Zelmanov's three-minute yeah. talk this morning where he said, algebra, what's next? And he sort of talked about three distinct areas he felt were important in, in his field. So I'm wondering, is there a similar thing in, in um, arithmetic geometry? Is there a, what are the big, big picture? What are the things we're still trying to understand? We're still trying to work out. Well, I think you shouldn't listen to the old guys. Okay. <laughs> I mean, they have their methods and they, yeah. have, they have solved the things they can solve and they, and they are left with the things they can't solve. Yeah. And, uh, and so they won't be able to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think as a young guy, at least in mathematics, you should get some, some step feel that you know better than your teacher. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. Although not if not if I'm your teacher, you should. <laughs> yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. My students know more than me. Very true. Very true. No, I like it if I have students and I give them a PhD topic and mm. they do something else and do it well. I like this very much. Yes, yes. No, I agree. I agree. This is potentially quite difficult, but um, could we try to discuss? your um, model's theorem and sort of, again, of course, we can't go into all the technical details. It's going to be way too advanced, but just sort of big picture, what is the theorem? What was the key insight that, you know, that you were able to bring to the problem that helped you eventually solve it um, and sort of get there? Okay. Uh, model proved in 1922. Mm -hmm. That for an elliptic curve, uh, I mean, it's known that the po points in a number field form an abelian group and that it's finitely generated. Mm -hmm. And then he remarked that for more complicated curves of genus bigger than one, he saw no reason why there shouldn't be uh, only a finite set of points. Okay. Uh, and this mm -hmm. became me known as a model conjecture. And then there was sort of easier case of function fields, which are somewhat similar to number fields, but where you have more tools. Mm -hmm. And they were first proved in the 50s and then the 60s. The, the Russian school, Partin and Arakilov, gave new proofs. And, uh, and then, as I said, there was a guy, Spiro, in Paris, mm -hmm. who did commutative algebra, and he was a friend of my teacher, Nastold. And he had ideas, uh, well, to do it in positive characteristic. And he tried, and then I visited him, and I found this interesting. Mm -hmm. And then I tried, and but there, it was clear that some things were missing for number fields. 
And, uh, well, and then I thought about it, and as I said, I thought it would be just something interesting. But then it turned out there was a new tool called Gala Representation, which worked, and then suddenly I realized, well, there was, was a related conjecture, the so-called Tate conjecture, which mm -hmm. I could do first. Then I realized that the same ideas worked for the model conjecture, and then there I was. And did that happen quickly? So once you realize this could work, does it, is, it a, is it a day, is it weeks, is it months? And just what was the timeline on, you know, once you've obviously had the idea? Well, I had the Tate conjecture and I talked in, in the famous Oberwolfach Institute and uh, Spiro was there. Mm -hmm. And when I came home, uh, I realized, well, I found out that it could be done also for the full model conjecture. And then I worked this out and then tried try to check it because, uh, as I said, I mean, yes. usually you are afraid that Absolutely, something yes. went wrong. Yes. But then uh, things were right, and I, I wrote a paper, and it got circulated, and it made a big stir. Yeah. Um, and then finally, do you have a favorite um, mathematical theorem or mathematical result that you just think is, is, is a beautiful way to represent our subject, or just something you find interesting, fascinating? Well, I mean, I... People discuss what is the most beautiful formula, and for me it's e to the 2 pi i is 1. Oh, so Oilers. not e to the i pi, you prefer the 2 pi i? Nine. Okay. Nine, this is more complete. Okay, very nice. Okay, so, yeah. so Euler's identity squared. Yeah. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, good. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you for, for giving the time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and, and yes. uh, your mathematical insight to all of the viewers um, and thank you to all of you for watching. If you have enjoyed this and you want to see uh, more interviews, more videos of me doing maths exams or various other maths problems I find interesting, then do subscribe to the channel uh, and I'll see you all very soon. Take care.